Praise. Thank you, Joy. Praise. We want to give God praise for his goodness and for his kindness. The good news is that we serve a God who is always near. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. We serve a God who is always near. And so no matter what we are facing, no matter how difficult the road gets, we are guaranteed that he is with us. Good morning, everybody. Everybody good? We wanted to give God praise. I want to invite you back to the book of Exodus, the 14th chapter. This time, we're going to look at verse 15. But I need to make a little connection for especially those of you that didn't quite get it. We are sharing on the theme, the march to freedom. And today takes us into the second half. In chapter 15, it reads like this from the NIV. I want you to hear the word. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites, speak to the Israelites, tell the Israelites to move on, to keep moving. We're gonna lift up the theme, the sub theme today. Keep moving. I want you to turn to your neighbor, tell him, keep moving. I know that it might be difficult, but keep moving. So Father, we come before you today and we give you honor. We give you glory and we give you praise. We are so thankful for your presence. We're so thankful for your kindness. We're thankful for your grace. And now that you've brought us together, we pray that you'll speak to us. We do pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. We acknowledge you as our God and as our Redeemer. In the name of Jesus, let the church say, now open your mouth and let's give God some praise in this house. Sometimes you got to praise your way through. Open your mouth and give God praise. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. We want to recognize as we recognize the absence. We want to recognize the presence of our executive pastor and his wife back from their honeymoon. Full of life and splendor. Amen. You don't have to blush. It's all right. You're fully licensed, sir. For those of you who were not here, and for those of us who need a reminder, on last week we introduced the subject, and I want to give a quick review because on last week, on the march to freedom, we noticed God's response when the people cried. The word says that they marched on boldly. But then later on, something happened and they began to cry out to the Lord. And so God, through Moses, gives a normal twofold response. Number one, he gave them precepts. He said to them, peace, fear not. He said, patience, stand still. He said, propriety, hold your peace, behave yourselves. And then he gave them some promises. He said that God will deliver you. 
And he said, deliverance will come. That's the dispatch. And then he says, you shall see the enemy, the enemy that is against you here today no more forever. That's the destruction. And finally he says, the Lord shall fight for you. God is your defender. So God responds when the people cry. And he spoke through Moses. And he told them to chill out. Relax. I got this. But today we want to ask ourselves the question, how does God respond when the leader cries out? So the people were told to fear not, stand still, stand firm, and watch the salvation of the Lord. That's a very difficult thing to do. In case you forget, the enemy is on their heels. The Red Sea is in front of them. And there are mountains on both sides. They are literally hedged in. They are literally trapped. And Moses has the audacity to tell them, chill out, be patient, hang in there. And so now we want to see how God responds to the leader. And God now issues a very surprising challenge to Moses. Listen to what he says, and I paraphrase, stop crying out to God. Stop crying out to me. Stop complaining. Arise. Go forward. Move on. Keep moving. That's a strange thing. Moses had just proclaimed a stirring challenge to the people. Do not fear. Stand still. Believe God. Watch the salvation of the Lord. Chill. But as soon as Moses completed his challenge to the people, he walked over to his tent and became gripped with fear himself. He obviously became despondent and hopeless, gripped by a sense of terrifying fear and helplessness. And I as a leader understand that. Because sometimes God will say to you, say this to the people. Especially when we were building, I remember, I said some strange things that I didn't understand. And then I walked away and I said, God, did you hear what I just said? And so you can understand Moses. He has just told them to chill out, to just hang in there, to be patient, and God will deliver you. And now he walks away from them. And he himself now is gripped with fear. And he begins to cry out to God, God, did you hear what I told them? God, do you see what we are facing God, do you understand where I'm at? Because the people now are turning on me. God, don't you hear? But I want you to notice what happened. I want you to notice what happened. When you stand up for God, God will stand up for you. I preached a message a long time ago, and maybe I need to revisit it. Don't back down when God is backing you up. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I know it looks rough. I know it looks terrible. I know it looks hard. But if God told you to go, you need to go in faith and know that God will be there for you. So God met his dear servant's need. God told Moses in no uncertain terms, why are you crying out to me? Stop crying. Get up. Arise. Tell the people to go forward, to keep moving. And Moses did exactly that. Which brings us to the heart of where we are today. How do you keep moving? 
How do you keep moving when there are so many things against you? How do you keep moving when you are despondent? How do you keep moving when the way doesn't seem clear? And if we are going to keep moving, two things are required. I want you to write this down somewhere. You're going to need it sometime. Number one, you have to denounce. Somebody said denounce. Come on, say it with conviction. Denounce. Translated, stop blaming. Stop crying. The Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Why are you crying to me? Why, why, why? Now, Scripture does not record Moses' plea to God. But whatever the plea was, we get the understanding that it was faulty and it was rebuked. One problem was it was too long. There's a time to pray. I want you to hear me today. Last week we told you, you need to go to God first. Make sure you talk to God. Make sure you pray to God. Make sure you seek God first. And today I'm telling you quite the opposite. There is a time to pray. But there's also a time to act. And you've got to know the difference. The rebuke says it was a time to act. Now, we all know that prayer is a great thing. I'm a beneficiary of prayer. Is there anybody here witness that God does answer prayer? <laughs> Has anybody had a situation that you couldn't handle and you talked to God and you prayed to God and God made a way? Do I have a witness here today? <laughs> so I know the power of prayer. I understand that there's a need for prayer and we need to keep on praying. As wonderful as prayer is, as great a thing as prayer is, it is no substitute for doing or duty. When God gives you a command, don't keep bothering him asking him about what to do when he has already told you what to do. Just be obedient and do what he says. So now in facing any problem, there's a time for prayer and a time for crying out to God. And I wish more of us would learn to cry out to God. Far too many of us suffer in silence. There's a time for studying and a time for analyzing the problem. You need to sometimes spend some time to study and analyze the problem. And you need to plan what you can do. But there's also a time to stop crying out and praying. There's a time to quit blaming. There's a time to stop shoving the blame over to somebody else. Because I want you to understand what was going on, in case you didn't get it. The people frowned on Moses. They were blaming Moses. They were really attacking Moses. And Moses is actually in his mind, as I can imagine. Lord, don't you hear how these people are treating me? Don't you see their faces? And God says, but why are you crying to me? Why? There's a time to stop analyzing and a time to stop planning. There's a time to arise, to go forth, to move on, to keep moving, trust in God, to roll the walls of the problem back. I don't know where you are today, but maybe God is saying to you, I heard you the first time. I heard you the second time. I heard you the third time. Now it's time to stop and move on. Sometimes we don't like the answer that God gives us, but I got a brother, a minister, who says that no is also an answer. How many of us don't like to hear the word no? <laughs> Especially when it comes to God. How many of us don't like to hear wait? Especially when it comes to God. But that's an answer. 
And so we have Moses and the children of Israel in a very, very difficult situation, and they're trying to understand what to do. And now the Moses, the leader himself, he's in a strait. What do I say? What do I do? I cried unto the Lord, and God says, stop it. Tell your neighbor, stop it. Some people just need to stop it. Have you, have, you, have you ever been in a place where somebody just keep ranting and ranting and ranting and ranting and ranting and just, 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 just addle your brain, as it were? Have you ever had to tell anybody, now you are not as rough as some of us are. Some of us will just straight up say, shut up. Others will say, can you please give me a little silence? But no matter how you phrase it, There comes a time and a point in your life when you need to stop complaining, stop blaming, denounce. Some of you need to shut off some people that are telling you it can't be done. Shut off some people that keep telling you you are no good. Shut off some voices that keep telling you don't try it. Tell somebody you'll learn to denounce Tell somebody, you got to learn to denounce. Now, when it comes to your destiny and this march to freedom, you can't be cute about it. You you, you got, listen, anybody that has you enslaved is not going to just release you. You got to fight for it. Come on now. But the second thing, because I don't want to keep you long till today at all. So first of all, there is the requirement to denounce. Say denounce one more time. Now, I I don't know what it is you need to denounce, but I think by now you know what it is. But the second thing you need to do is to decree. Somebody say decree. Now, let me set this up if I can. If you are a child, you ask, yeah? You ask your parents, and some children are now rude, they demand, but you ask. But if you are a king, if if you are royalty, you don't ask. Royalty, And, and the last time I checked, the Bible says, that you are, as a child of God, a royal priesthood. Come on now, come on now. Am I the only one who read this? That I'm a royal priesthood, a holy nation. In other words, I am royalty. I belong to the king. I'm a king's kid. And the last time I checked, a king does not go about asking questions and even making requests. A king makes a decree. He declares it. Oh, my God, you're not with me yet. One of the reasons you're stuck where you are stuck is because you're too cute and you don't understand the authority that God has given to you. God says, decree it. Declare it. Because if you decree a thing, it shall be done. How many of you understand the power of words? Speak those things that be not as though they were and they shall Be God commanded and it stood fast. He spoke. And last time I checked, I'm made in the image and likeness of God. I have the king's blood in me. I'm a king's kid. I have the king's seed in me. And I have the power and authority to declare. And so what God is saying to Moses now, I not only want you to denounce, stop crying, But I want you to decree. Here's what he says. Speak to the people. (laughs) Uh, So he didn't just say speak. But this matter of decreeing is to speak boldly. Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward, that they keep moving. Now, the command to go forward, to keep moving... Is a very great command. There's no room for retreat or recanting in this decree. However, watch this. 
To go forward means to go through the Red Sea. In case you forgot. When God told Moses to tell the people to go forward, God is literally saying, go through. Go through what? Go through where? You're talking about two million people, most of whom I'm sure couldn't swim. And God says to tell them to keep moving, to go through. Uh-oh. I want you to picture this. I want you to picture this. Most of us quote Psalms 23, especially verse 4 that says, Yea, though I, yea, though I, yea, though I, yea, though I walk. Ah, wait, 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 slow it down. Watch this. Most of us get stuck like this. Yea, though I walk too. Yea, though I walk too. No, it says, yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil because God is with me. So the command is not to walk to the Red Sea. That's where a lot of us get stuck. He says, walk through. In other words, you're not going to get stuck in there. Where you are now in a difficult place, where you are now in a dark place, is not your destiny. I wish somebody hear me this morning. I, I wish you hear me this morning. Where you are right now is not where God is taking you. He didn't say, tell them to move a little too. He told them to keep moving. Now, the, the Red Sea ain't going nowhere. At least not yet. <laughs> so if you're going to walk and keep moving, you got to make up in your mind that you're going through it. Now some of you are catching hell and you're holding on. Whenever you catch hell, don't hold it. Or some of you are just still sleeping. God will not bring you to it unless God is able to take you through it. I want to say to somebody, stop looking at your mountain. Stop looking at your problem. Stop looking at... God says, move forward. Go through it. Here's the thing. You will not conquer what you won't confront. Now, I want you to hear me. We got to learn to confront our fears. And Pastor Rama, we need to tell people that it's okay to admit that I'm afraid. It's okay to say I'm afraid. And it's okay to say I fear this or that. But don't stay there. I want to take you quickly to Psalms 56. Keep your Bibles flexible because I'm going to give you a whole lot of scriptures, especially when I come down to the close. What's the progression in Psalms 56 verses 3 and 4? Watch this. The psalmist begins like this. Whenever I am afraid, he admits, I will trust in you, God. What's the progression? Watch this. Some of us are stuck in the first part. We wait until we are afraid to trust in God. The psalmist progresses, he grows up, and he says, hear this, in God I will praise his word, in God I have put my trust, I will not be afraid. You need to graduate to the second level. Not only I am afraid and I will trust in God, but you need to grow up to say, I will trust in God and not be afraid. Woo. Can, can, I, can, I, can we go a little deeper? Uh, let's go over to Matthew or Mark chapter 9, just to illustrate a little bit. Verses 23 through 24. Jesus said to him, if, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Watch this. 
Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Hmm. I want you to notice. You will not conquer what you won't confront, and you will not change what you tolerate. <laughs> we we, we got to learn to confess our sins. Now, the word confess basically means to agree with God, to call it what God calls it. Nowadays, we have all kind of cute terms for sin. I made a mistake. I messed up. It's a maladjustment. Just call the thing what it is. It's sin. Amen? You call cancer a, a, a soul, and that doesn't change the nature of cancer. The, the problem with most of us, come a little, is most of us are confessing the wrong things. I, I want to, you, look, look, look at Matthew. Look at Matthew chapter 9, just, just to show you something. Look, look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. But Jesus, knowing their hearts, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think it evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Arise and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Wait a minute. I read this story. And I'm told that the man was paralyzed. D didn't you read the same thing? I thought his problem was paralysis. But watch this. Jesus says, thy sins are forgiven you. So the paralysis was a symptom of his deeper problem. Most of us are confessing the wrong thing. We need to come to grips with understanding. Your problem, he says, is not paralysis. That's a result your problem is sin. Stop jumping out of windows that you didn't build. I'm just imagining that this brother, oh Lord, he got paralyzed because he jumped out a window because the husband came unexpectedly. Is that all right? So Jesus, Jesus is saying, your problem is not paralysis. That's what caused it. Your problem, you need to stay in your own house. Stop jumping out of windows. He dropped so hard. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus. Let's move on. Let's move on. You all can't handle this. I, I didn't make this up. Jesus didn't address the paralysis yet. He says, and he wanted to say, in beginning, your sins be forgiven. But the people had a problem with that because they say, you're not God. So Jesus said, there's no difference if I say your sins are forgiven or just rise up and walk. Because the truth of the matter is, if you're just walking and your sins are not forgiving, you're still a walking sinner. A lot of us are just elevating people. But if you elevate a sinner, he's just an elevated sinner. All you've done is made him smarter. He knows now how not to get caught. So he's not sorry for his sins. He's just sorry that you caught him. But the truth of the matter is whether you're caught or not, it is sin. Now, that's the command. The command looks impossible. He, he tells them to go forward. But I want you to hear me that if God commands, God will enable. I, I don't know who I'm talking to, but when, we, when you get to the seemingly impossible command, you need to focus on the commandment and let God do the enabling. Because here's the thing. God's command is your enabling. 
enablement. If, in other words, if God tells you to do it, you have already been enabled to do it. I want to give you an illustration. This was the same case with the man whose hand was withered. His hand being withered means he couldn't stretch it out. I want, to know, I want you to notice something. So the man's situation, or, or you might say the man's problem, is that he can't stretch out his hand. Stay with me. Don't let, let the child be a child. Stay with me. You're all so easily distracted. Only one person needs to pick up a child. What are you doing? So here's the thing. The man's situation is that he can't stretch out his hand. But I want you to notice this. What does Jesus say to him? What does Jesus say to him? Jesus says, stretch forth your hand. Duh, if I could, I would. That's my problem. And Jesus is saying, your problem is the solution. Stretch out your hand. Some of you missed that. What you are complaining about, what you are saying you can't do, God is commanding you to do because his command enables you to do what you say you can't do. So the man's problem was I can't stretch out my hand. The solution, Jesus says, is stretch out your hand. Now God demands that we arise and we go forth, keep moving, that we be diligent, steadfast, and unmovable in life. I want you to hear the word of God. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Matthew 10, 22. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful, diligent. 1 Corinthians 4 and 2. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and let us not be wary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not, Galatians 6, 9. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I will give to them, even to the children of Israel, Joshua 1, 2. God demands that we be diligent. But God also demands zeal in life. Full energy. Full commitment. No procrastinating. No half-stepping. God is speaking to somebody right now. He says, say not therefore that there are four months and then come at the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are already white to harvest. It's not about next month and two months or four months. God says your harvest is ready. We keep missing it because we keep looking at things through our own human eyes and understanding. And God says it looks like it's going to take four months before it comes to pass. And God says, I have already decreed it, and my decree is its fulfillment. So what you are waiting for is waiting for you. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I, wish you got, I wish you got that. What you are waiting for is waiting for you. Watch this. So we labor in the work, and half of them had the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. Nehemiah 4, 21. In other words, they stuck to it. Far too many of us quit too soon. We give up too quickly. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness therefore or thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation therefore as a lamb that burned. In other words, I can't quit now. There is too much at stake. It's about the next generation. And he said unto them, how is it that you that sought me? Don't you know that I must be about my father's business? 
Luke 2, 49, Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. John 4, 34, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, for the night comes when no man can work. John 9, 4. Here's what is said about Jesus. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Tell your neighbor, keep moving. Come on, tell your neighbor, keep moving. As I bring this sermon to a close, I want to share with you a poem that has blessed me. It's a poem entitled, Mother to Son by Langston Hughes. I want you to hear. Let me tell you a bit about Langston first. Langston Hughes was a prominent writer during the Harlem Renaissance. In this poem, a mother uses the metaphor of life being like a staircase to give advice to her son. While there are difficult times, you must keep moving like you would while walking up a staircase. Here is the poem. I want you not to miss a word of it. Well, son, I tell you, life for me ain't no crystal stair. It's hard tacks in it and splinters and boards turn up and places with no carpet on the floor bare. But all the time it's been a climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't no light. So boy, don't you turn back now. Don't you sit down on the steps because you find it's kind of dark and hard. Don't you fall now, for I see's still going, honey. I's still climbing, and life for me ain't no crystal stair. Martin Luther King Jr. says, if you can't run, walk. And if you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. May the Lord bless you as we march to freedom. When we talk about freedom, I want to remind you that we're not just talking about freedom from slavery. We're talking about freedom in every sense of the word. Freedom from an unforgiving spirit. Freedom from financial bondage. Freedom from debt. Freedom from anger and hate. Because the word says, whom the Son of Man sets free. 
is free indeed. Freedom from being afraid to step out because it looks dark. Freedom to go where others say you can't go. We're talking about freedom. So here, two things are necessary. One, you got to learn to denounce. There's some things and people you need to say no to. But secondly, you need to learn to decree. It doesn't matter what it looks like. You gotta learn to say what God says. So I want every head bowed. I want the eyes closed. Some of you are asking for more time. If I had more time, I'll do this or that. Time doesn't solve anything, it's what you do with the time. So I'm going to ask, is there one here today? I just want to pray with you and for you. Is there one here today who has never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior? Just lift your hand and we'll pray with and for you. Is there a believer? Is there believers, we get ready to close, who's been stuck in a particular place, stuck because of a particular situation, stuck, and you don't know what to do, God says to you, God says to me, keep moving. And would you say, I don't know where to go. There's nowhere to go. God says, keep moving. I want to know, is there someone here who's willing to trust God in and for the impossible, I'm going to ask you to come. Maybe you've been praying for a long time for someone, for something, and it seems impossible. I'm going to ask you to come. Now, here we go. Father, What you've asked me to do, what you've told me to do, I've done it. I've declared your word. I pray now for these brethren who have stepped forward. They are not satisfied with mediocrity. They are not satisfied with where they are. They know that you're calling them higher. They know that you have so much more in store for them. But the situations around them are causing them to question. Father, we thank you now that faith will arise in their hearts. And like the psalmist in Psalms 56, they're not only going to call on you when they're fearful, but Lord, now they've found out a way to trust in you and not be afraid. They've learned how to step out on faith, step out on your word, just like Peter, if it be you, bid me come. And people think that Peter stepped out on water. That's what they can see physically. But God, we know better. He stepped out on the word. And so, Father, I pray that you give my sister, give my brother that bold faith to not only speak your word, but to act on your word. We thank you for all of this. And even now, as we get ready to leave this place, but never your presence, we thank you for your goodness. We give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. Let all of God's children say, Amen. God bless you. I will trust.